Good morning. Good to see you all. Good to be back. Good to minister the word again right here at the church. And uh, my hope is that God is using what we want to say in these last two weeks, last week and then again uh, this Sunday. Uh, this is part two of uh, the series that we're in, and we're calling it Dealing with Difficulties. I'd like you to open your Bible to James, the very first chapter, and we'll be looking into the primary part of verses 1 through 12. Now you know that last week we began a two-part series about dealing with personal difficulties. We're looking at James 1, verses 1 and following to help us in our pursuit. James calls our difficulties trials. We see that in verse 2 where James calls them various trials. And by that he means the various part, that there are many kind of things that knock us. And we say, thanks a lot, James, I know that. But that's the point here. Lots of stuff can knock us down. And James says, that's right, they're called various trials. And then verse 12, again, that word is used, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, which gives you another feeling of that trials are weighty so that we get under them as it is, and they're pushing us down, and we need to make sure we're handling them well so they don't knock us out. Now, James identifies these trials as tests of our faith. How many like tests of your faith? Raise your hand. Raise the other one. Am I the only one? My hands are not up. I was just illustrating. No, we don't like tests. I didn't like them in high school. I didn't like them in college. I didn't like them in grad school. I thought they'd end then. They didn't. But tests go on, and you have them, I have them, and we will until the time that we see our Lord someday, and all of those things, tests, will be gone. But they're there. They're real. They're in all of our lives, difficulties of life that are common to everyone, no matter what your age may be. If you gave a story of your life, it will include the difficulties you face. It's true for all of us, uh, no exceptions. And sometimes those difficulties threaten to break us, don't they? Uh, I'm sure that most of you, maybe all of you here, have said of the difficulties you face, some of them that you were under felt more weighty than you could bear. And we've all been there and wondered about the kind of stuff that God allows us to go through or causes us to go through as well. Well, that's what we're talking about in this two-part series, dealing with difficulties and dealing with them properly as a Christian. Now, James tells us that three factors come into play when we deal with the issue of my trials. One is my attitude toward trials. We talked about that last Sunday morning. The second is my expectation of trials. Yes, there is a good outcome. In fact, there were four that we mentioned of our trials, and we did that last week as well. And today, we want to move into the third area that has to do with dealing with my difficulties, and that is my handling of trials. This is the one that gets done. This is the idea that makes sure we got a handle on it so that we can, in fact, do what we should, and therefore the phrase, my handling of trials. Got to do that. Now we've talked about the other two. Let's move into this one. Uh, how, now, when we talk about this, these difficulties that come, you can handle trials one of two ways. You can handle them your way or God's way. And that option's always there, and it hits us right away. In fact, our temptation is to go our way, not God's way. If you handle trials, if I handle trials my way, if we do it our way, then we're asking for problems. We don't know how to do this well. <laughs> we don't know how on our own to handle problems well. We just weren't equipped for that. On the other hand, we can do them God's way, and then we're asking for solutions. Now, if you insist on going one way or the other, remember it's in your hands. The handling part is yours. Your hands are making this happen. So how you handle them is going to be your choice, and you have to make sure that you're wise about the way you handle stuff that hurts. We're not talking about games today at all. 
talking about real life things. We're talking about life and death things. We're ca- talking about health and lack thereof. We're talking about homes that come into difficult problems and difficulties with parents or children and vice versa, both uh, emotionally and physically, et cetera, et cetera. It is there, my handling of trials is in my hands. And, uh, and I need to make sure as a believer, you need to make sure as a believer that you're handling these trials the right way, handling them God's way. And that's what is here. Uh, that's what James is going to tell us, how to handle stuff God's way, not your way, not somebody else's way, but this need for supernatural intervention is made very clear. Three things that we need to see that are set forth here that will help us to handle our difficulties or our trials well. Number one, number one, we need to turn from us with a question and ask God to give wisdom. Lord, give me wisdom in this regard. Verse 5 says that, but if any of you lacks wisdom, and that's all of us, if any of you lacks wisdom, we all do, let him or her, it's generic there, ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Ask God for wisdom. Now, two statements stand out in this verse, not just one. The statement, ask of God, and also the statement, it will be given. Now, it's interesting, and ask of God is a present active and it's saying, keep on asking. Why would we do that? Why would we keep on asking? Why would James, guided by the Spirit, say, keep on doing it? Is it once enough? Lord, give me wisdom. No, because you vacillate, and so do I. The ask of God is in order to get you to focus in the right place. Doesn't mean we can't talk to other believers about things. Not at all. The Word of God makes it clear we can. But our primary direction of the asking is of God. God, give me wisdom. And I'm reminded of that focus, Lord. I need to do that. So keep on doing that. The first moment something comes your way, we probably just feel the weight of it. We're under it. And we need someone to lift the weight. And we can't do it because we're the ones that are under. We can't do the push-up to get it up. And, And when we feel the weight, and then we ask of God. So Initially, we all face trials the same way. It hurts. Feels too heavy. Don't think it's fair. Not sure God's being just in what he's doing to us. And why this? I just had one. And all the stuff that we throw up toward heaven. And we, are, we need to, therefore, keep on asking, Lord, I need wisdom. My tendency will be to go back to my own devices. I need to keep on asking. And then we have this very wonderful promise. Don't you love the promises of God? Well, the truth is sometimes we don't. Because we're not sure, we're not sure that they happen. They do. They always do. But the timing is usually different for us with the promise of God. But here we have this powerful promise from God. And that is this, that if you ask of God for wisdom, He will give it to you. He will do it. He will be there as the answer. Uh, After all, remember, he's the reason. He either allows or causes trials in your life and my life. We're not an accident of time. We have accidents, but God knows they're going to happen. We have difficulties we don't want, but God knows it's in the plan he has for you and for me And we're told to ask of God, and it will be given. Now, for a long time, I applied this verse in a broad, general way. Uh, I viewed it as as meaning, any time you need wisdom about anything, ask God for wisdom. Now, to view this verse in that way is not unbiblical, but to do so is to miss its primary application in the context. What is James talking about? He's talking about trials, talking about tests of faith. And talking about trials, James says in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, well, wisdom about what? Anything in general? No. Then what? 
trials in particular. If there's anything that you need wisdom for, and I need wisdom for, is when stuff hurts, makes no sense, we need God's wisdom because that's the time we can be really foolish and really stupid. And we can act out in ways that are not good, not right, and especially not wise. I do that. You do that. We'll see in a moment that God knows we do that. And even then, he's there to help us because we're going to need his help. And we need, do need his help all the time. But we need to ask God to give us wisdom in handling the difficulty the right way. That's what James is talking about. Trials in particular. Now, what is a person asking here? Let me put this into kind of a statement to God. Lord, Lord, give me wisdom in handling this trial. Help me to handle it right. Help me to respond right. Help me to be wise in handling this trial. Now, when we handle things right, when we handle the difficult stuff right, we're on the plus meter then, not on the minus meter then. And God wants you on the plus. God wants you to know that if you will depend upon him and trust him to give you wisdom, to help you to know sourced in the word of God the truths that are there, or hear those truths taught perhaps from the pulpit, perhaps in your own study, however you get them, that God wants to wonderfully do that for you and for me. So we need to ask God for wisdom. Well, that's all well and good, and that's very, very important. Uh, the, the, the critical thing in, in the Christian life is not what happens to me, but how I handle what God already knew was going to happen in my life. I need to ask God to give me help. But when you, when you say to the Lord, give me wisdom in handling this, uh, what is God's promise? Well, wisdom will be given generously and without reproach. D doesn't it look strange to you when you read that? Generously, and then those words, and without reproach. Why is that added, that without reproach statement? What's going on here? Why does God guide James to say that without reproach? Uh, and that word reproach is a nasty word. The word means to cast in one's teeth. It, it, the idea is to say back to you what was just said, but in a derogatory manner, uh, to give stinging words. It's the kind of thing that can happen to you when maybe you've done something wrong, and then you have a result that's not good, and someone says, you deserve the pain you're in right now. Cause and effect. You did wrong, you got this. Sowing and reaping, and people blast away. And have you ever had people do that? I have. You, you're in trouble because of you. Now, that's often true. Not me, but my wife does that all the time, gets in trouble because of her. And I'm so wise I can see it. But we, we do things sometimes, and they're stupid. They're not wise, and people can see it. And so can God. <laughs> can he ever? What's being said here? I think this is what God is trying to tell us uh, through James, and that is this. Even if you're facing something as a consequence of some foolish, unwise decision, God's not going to spit it back out in your face, dummy, stupid. Why did you make that decision? I hope you cook good. God doesn't do that. That's not our God. He knows our weaknesses, but he doesn't throw them. What does he do when we come to him if we've made a dumb decision? He says, I want to help you. Just ask me to. Don't you wish God would just help us? Well, he does sometimes. You know that. You know that, right? But don't you wish that there, there were, you, you, we wouldn't make any more mistakes? But we'd be in heaven then. We're not perfect yet. And we're still learning how to lean on the everlasting arms of God, learning and leaning and trusting and obeying. And we, we, we learn so slowly, don't we? Sometimes I think some of us live a little longer because God said, you know what, you're a bullhead. I just got to work in you longer. I'll probably live to 150. <laughs> Listening and learning and leaning and becoming the kind of person you want to be. And God wants you to be as a 
young person, as a young adult, as an adult, as a senior adult. And God says, I, I will give you wisdom, I, and I will do this. I will give it to you generously. You want to become wise? I do. I, I tell you, I, I mean, when you think of Solomon, you think he made the right decision. Wealth or wisdom? He took wisdom. Didn't always use his wisdom well, did he? That's the problem, by the way, with Solomon. It, he knew better when he made those dumb decisions that are all there in the Bible for you and me to read about. But, but it's wonderful to see a wise man, isn't it? And, and wise men have made bad decisions also. And Moses had made a lot of decisions, and we all know about those. But at the end of the time, he, no, nobody greater than Moses, the Word of God says. Why? Because he was learning, even though sometimes he was blowing it. You, you're doing that, aren't you? You're learning, but sometimes you blow it. But see, it ought not to be you're always blowing it. See, that, that, that's not excusable. Uh, but we need to learn, and then we grow, and we develop. And God says, I will give wisdom to you generously. I will freely, openly do that for you because I want to do that. God's way, when we have tests, deserved or not, is to give wisdom generously without casting it in our teeth. So the first way to handle trials is ask God to give wisdom in handling it. There is a second way also here made clear in James, and that is this. Now listen carefully. Believe God will give wisdom. <laughs> I mean, it's very possible, and I'm sure that you've done it. I've probably done it a thousand times. That is, give me wisdom and expect nothing from heaven. Guess what comes when you do that? Nothing from heaven. You don't expect anything? Good, you got your prayer answered. Nothing from heaven. God wants you to believe that he will do what you need to have done regarding the difficulty that he put you in. He knows how to get you into it, knows how to get you out of it, and he said, come to me and ask for wisdom for doing that to deal with it, to deal with it the right way. Believe God will give wisdom. Listen to verses 6 and following. But he must, this is not an option, no option here, in terms of the good result you want, uh, but he must, he or she must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Male and female are envisioned here. Uh, now we're to ask Believe God will give the wisdom, ask in faith. And by the way, that's also a present active. Keep on asking because we, 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 vow, we vary. We, 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 we aren't sure we're going to trust God. We're going to do it. And there's a battle that goes on at this point in your life. When you have difficulties, two things come flying right at you. The one is faith because you're a Christian and the other is doubt because you're a Christian. The doubt is pushed in by the enemy. The faith is pushed in by God. And the battle is between you and what you're hearing between God and the enemy. And we vacillate. Faith, doubt, doubt, faith, and it's tough. And we, we doubt whether or not this is fair. We doubt whether or not that we can handle this. We, we try to handle ourselves, and we're not sure that God will do what he says he will do if I ask him to do it. And we are to believe that God will do what he said he will do. Well, the greatest enemy of faith is doubt. And our greatest tendency when asking God to do something is that we doubt that he'll do it. That is, we doubt in the practical, not in the theoretical. We believe God will do and can do anything, but will he for us? And we're not sure then, and doubt comes in. Now, what is the greatest answer for doubt? And we're liable to say answered prayer, but that really isn't it. The greatest answer for doubt is not answered prayer. The greatest answer is faith in God even before the answer comes. Faith in God before the answer comes. Trusting God when we don't have the answer right there immediately upon the request 
and going on saying, God, give me wisdom. I need it now. Because time goes on, doesn't it? Today it happens and tomorrow it's still there. Or it happened in a given yesterday and it remained in some of the tomorrows of those yesterdays. And, and the stuff was there and God says, keep on asking me. Keep on trusting me. Believe I will answer. I may not answer it the day you want it. But you keep asking me. You keep what, what does that do? It keeps your focus right. Did you hear that? If you don't focus on faith, you will be focusing on doubt. If you don't focus on a heavenly answer, you're going to be left with earthly doubt that will make it feel like the problem is going to crush you. And so you stay under the weight of the trial and you did not make the progress and I don't make the progress that God wants us to make. James says, ask in faith without any doubting. That is really hard. Now that's a goal. Please listen carefully. There are, there are things in the Word of God that are very important to our walk with the Lord. We are, be, we are to be holy as Jesus is holy. What's that about? We're not going to become like Jesus till we see him and then we'll be like him till we see him as he is. He'll make us like him, but that's our goal. That's what we're shooting for. We're to be righteous. That's our goal. That's what we're just shooting for. When here we have this issue of without doubting, is that that is not to be in our lives, but sometimes it creeps into us because it's there, and we need to keep on battling it. Battle the doubt. Battle the doubt. And focus on the faith, and then make sure your faith has an object, and that's God. How big is your God? I mean, I mean, many of you know what J.B. Phillips wrote years ago. Your God is too small. Yes, Phillips was right. Our view of God is too small. Larry Katz's view of God is too small. I don't know if I'll live long enough to have a view of God I wish I did have. I don't have a small view of God. But there are times when my view of God is too small and your view is too small. And guess when that is? When you need him most. When you need him most. Our view of God's too small. We question his ability. He has no lack of ability. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. And, all we, and God wants us to learn that so that we can live our lives with a kind of calm. When the sea comes and the storms are there, the storms of life that hit us. And so we don't want to be those who doubt and are like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been out in the sea when the weather got bad, but I have from time to time. Not a whole lot. I don't like to go out into the water. I know there are sharks and everything. I'm sure they're in what, good water, bad water, any water. I think I saw one in the bathtub the other day. <laughs> you know, and I stay out. We, we, I love the beach, but I don't go in the water. I send the kids in. But anyway, we just... just <laughs> But, uh, uh, but trusting the Lord in, that, that in our lives sometime are like the sea, driven, tossed by the wind. That man ought not to expect to receive anything from the Lord. God's not going to answer that kind of prayer, that kind of request, that kind of pleading, and being a double-minded man. And that double-minded man is doubt, faith, doubt, faith, doubt, faith. That doesn't work, does it? Doesn't work, doubt, faith, doubt, faith. And God is pushing us toward faith. And as he pushes us toward faith, he wants us to believe he will give wisdom to us. Faith is a choice. Just as love is a choice. Faith is a choice. Uh, one person put it this way, doubt sees the obstacles, faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night, faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step, faith soars on high. Doubt questions who believes, and faith answers I. And that conflict is there, and doubt seeing the obstacles and seeing the darkest night, and, and afraid, dreads to take a step, and questions who believes, and faith, faith sees the way, faith sees the day, faith soars on high, faith 
answers, I. I will trust you, Lord. I will trust you. In, in this thing that's so hard and so heavy and that's weighing me down that I'm under, that I'm under. And God wants to make that difference in your life day by day so that you will look just like the instrument that he wants you to be, one who knows how to trust him in the storms of life and not be tossed and turned by the storms of life. Faith is idle, one man said, when circumstances are right. Only when they are adverse is one's faith in God exercised. Faith like muscle grows strong and supple with exercise. And we all need exercise, do we not? Do we not? Believe that God will answer. And then the third thing. And the third thing is this, which seems so strange. But it's just like God to say things that seem so strange to us weary pilgrims, sometime as we are, glory in the trial. What? Yes, glory in the trial. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 reads this way, but the brother of humble, cir uh, hum <clears throat> but the brother of humble circumstance is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away, for the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Glory. It's interesting here that the rich man is noted. It used to be, in this case, the rich Christian and the poor man, and it's the poor Christian. These are people who know the Lord, same God, and we're to glory in our trials. Now, that, that word glory, kalkakomai, uh, it, it means to boast, it means to glory, it means to pride oneself in something. It's only used four times, this Greek word, in, in the New Testament, it's, and it's used only once in a negative sense, and it's actually used in that negative sense in James 4. Just look there for a minute, since it's right there in the text, in James 4, and verse 16, we read this word, and this is our word, uh, uh, but as it is, you boast, there's our word, in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil, that, that self-centered boasting. But here is a boasting, here is a pride that says, uh, God was pleased to bring difficulties into my life. He could trust me with these difficulties. We just received a magazine from Taylor University. I, after going to Philadelphia Bible Institute for three years, I went to Taylor University and there got my degree in phys ed and also in history and then after that on to Dallas. And, uh, but there's a front page uh, picture and then there's an article about a young athlete that was uh, from Taylor. He was a football player, a big guy. You could see that from the picture they showed. And, uh, he was with his brothers, they were checking their guns, they were hunters, and they were cleaning their guns, and unfortunately with one of the guns, as it, one of the brothers was cleaning the gun, it had a bullet in it, didn't know it, and it went off, and went right through the part of the neck and the head of the boy and paralyzed him, but not permanently. And he had a very interesting statement, and I thought this was so good and apropos for today. His comment and his testimony, he, he really has recovered almost completely, which is amazing as you read the story. But he said this, God was pleased to honor me by putting me through this test. That was a kid who was in college. He was probably somewhere around 19, 20, 21, and a Christian who understood it, he was glorying in his trial. And God is using him. He never expected he'd be on the cover of Taylor Magazine, which, by the way, has a large circulation, and that he would be able to give his testimony. I read that, and I thought, how many young men or young women will read that article and be greatly encouraged with a man, a young man, who thought he might be permanently paralyzed, and it could have been, who was glorying in his trial. Lord, you were so fit to use me by putting me through that. He could have been really an angry young man. 
How would you have responded to that? How would I have responded to that? And, but glory. And, and, and the point here, talking about those who, have, who were poor Christians and those who were poor or rich Christians, is, is to say this. that The poor man uh, has to realize God is working in my life. The evidence of it is difficulties. Doesn't that seem strange? But it's true. Chuck Swindell, who now is well-known, but at a point when he wasn't well-known, was asked the question one time, what was the thing more than anything else that helped to make you the man that you are today? And Chuck said, my two failed ministries where the people in each of those churches didn't want him anymore. It really hurt. It really hurt him. But it was the best thing for him. He needed that pain. He needed that pressure. He needed to be under that difficulty. What's making you the man and the woman that you really are and God wants you to be? The reason you are who you are and live the way you do is how you responded to trials. And I hope you've responded well. And I hope I have responded well and can be an honest model, not a perfect model, but an honest model as a pastor teacher that when we handle them well, we need to know we were honored by God to go through what he put us through. Wow. See, God said you can handle it. Look at my servant Job. He can handle it. Look at my servant and then mention a name and call your name out. You can handle it. Sometimes we don't, though, do we? Sometimes I don't. But we need to, and we always can. It is a choice that we need to make and make it wisely and right. You see, we we need to know that God is working in our lives, and a great evidence of that is the difficulties that we go through, or are the difficulties we go through. So the rich men and poor men are alike. These things come. The third thing here, then, is glory, boast in the trial. Thank you, Lord, that you could trust me with this, that you could trust me with this hurt, this pain, this thing. Well, trials, uh, our response to trials. And in the whole picture, this difficulties that we face, and we all face, uh, how do we deal with these things? Well, there's my attitude toward trials that, needs to be right. We need to consider it all joy when we fall in these various trials. My expectation of trials, that they will produce uh, endurance and maturity and happiness and reward. And my handling of trials, what we've talked about just today. Ask God to give wisdom. Believe God will give wisdom. Glory in the trial. Thank you, Lord, that I'm, I'm the kind of a man or woman you thought and knew could handle this. You can handle it with God. Not, not as an orphan, not all alone. You can handle it with God. What are you facing today? What did you face yesterday? What have you faced at different times in your life? Tough things. Tough things. We all have. Some of you are very young and face some hard stuff. Some of you are very old and face some hard stuff. How is very old? I don't know. Is that 80? Is it 90? I don't know. <laughs> my, my dear friends, male and female, young and old, God wants to do some great things in you. And that means all of you. And he'll get it done what he wants done by allowing and causing some hard stuff that you need to handle well. And you can. You won't always do it. Sometime you'll blow it. I have. I probably will even before uh, I get to heaven. But God is sufficient for what you're going through right now. Let him help you. Give you wisdom. Get you through. Believe that he will. Take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. God will take care of you. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you that you're a good God, a loving God. You love the world. Thank you that you do. You love your people. Thank you that you do. And you bring stuff and allow stuff and give us the privilege of hurting for your glory and that we can glory in that difficulty because you honored us by letting us go through some stuff. Some people are going through some heavy weights right now, Lord, and uh, they need your touch. And uh, I pray that there will be that reaching up to you that will move away from the debate between faith and doubt and leave doubt far behind and faith on top and you right in the middle of what we face in Jesus' name. Amen. It's quite a challenge, quite an encouragement. If you would like to talk to someone about spiritual things, members of our prayer and care team will be down front here at the conclusion of the service, and as others are leaving, uh, please feel free to come down front and uh, pray with them. Let's stand together, please, as we're dismissed here this morning. And now to him who loves us, has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve the one and true God our Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.